title of the message you see from the bulletin is A House of Prayer, and I am taking that from Mark chapter 11, where Jesus speaking to those that were around the temple grounds, he says in verse 17, then he taught and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the, for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. This morning, we were looking at our Father in heaven, and I didn't emphasize the hour in our Father this morning because I wanted to bring attention to it tonight as I attempt to emphasize the importance of collective or group prayer in the church. Or, or the church being a house of prayer. Our, the word our, the plural our, stands out really in the words of Jesus back in Matthew 6, especially in contrast to what he has said earlier in verse 6 when we looked upon that, the, the, the emphasis upon thy or you, the singular, your father, thy father. And then there is this, transition it seems in verse 9 as he teaches the manner for prayer he turns to a plural pronoun all through this prayer you see the plural pronoun our and us and why does he do that well it's possible that jesus is just emphasizing the need for us to pray for others, not only for ourselves. So our Father, just don't be stuck on yourself, your Father. Remember, He is others' Father's others' Father too. And therefore, as you pray this prayer, think about others also. That, that could be. I'm not denying that that is something of what Jesus may be intending. But it seems at least in my mind, more plausible that he is emphasizing our unity together in the family of God as we pray together, our Father. And so emphasizing the fact that we are not the only ones praying. In fact, we are, in the context of, it, of the church, we are praying together, our Father. It's certainly clear Early on in uh, the New Testament, Matthew 18, Jesus makes it clear that he anticipated that there would be group prayer. There would be, there wouldn't only be isolated prayer, or in other words, each individual going to a secret place and in that private place doing your prayer. And that's the only context in which prayer would take place. And you see this in Matthew chapter 18. And verses 19 and 20, the context here is he is referring to the church. He's referring to how we are to relate to a sinning brother, someone who sins against us. We're to go to him. And you know the, you know that part of the passage. And then he continues speaking and he says in verse 19, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, and that word ask there is the same word that Jesus uses back in Matthew 6 and verse 8 when he says, for your father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. So it is a word that is used in relationship to prayer. And so it's reasonable for us to conclude that that is at least a primary thing that Jesus has in mind in Matthew 18 verses 19 and 20. When he speaks of us agreeing on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. John Gill, commenting on verse 19, said this, A great encouragement is this to social prayer, though ever so few are engaged in it. So he called it social prayer. Sometimes we refer to it maybe as corporate prayer or gathered prayer. Or there's other words that might be used, but social prayer. Prayer, prayer done 
as we are together in relationship to one another. So when we pray together saying, Our Father, tonight when, Charles, you used that expression, I believe, Our Father, and it should be used very commonly when we are together, we are acknowledging our relationship together in Christ as we join one another in the Holy of Holies. We are entering together. Those of us who are able to, if we, if He is your Father, then we are coming together addressing our Father in that place of prayer, entering together into that chamber. And that holy place. And I want to submit to you tonight that in so much as prayer forms a central part of our purpose for coming together, in so much as prayer forms a central part of our purpose for coming together, we participate in the fulfillment of Isaiah 56, 7, which is what Jesus is quoting in Mark chapter 11 and verse 7 when he drives the thieves who are profiteering in the temple. He drives them out and he draws upon Isaiah 56, 7. By the way, it was in the court of the Gentiles where the Gentiles who come where this was going on and where Jesus is saying what he's saying. And this fits the very prophecy of Isaiah where he said, Jesus says, is it not written? So he quotes Isaiah 56, 7, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, all the nations, not just the Jews, all the nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. And so we, as we are a house of prayer, as prayer is a primary, central part of our purpose for coming together, we are entering into the fulfillment of that prophecy of Isaiah 56 and verse 7. The church is his house. It is his temple. And I know that temple has other uses, but it is his temple. And it's represented by every regular assembly of baptized believers, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of nationality, Believers of all the nations who are joined together in Christ, coming together in one place called the church. And so Paul, writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, 15, he addresses, actually all of 1 Timothy, but in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, he refers to conduct. He calls it that you may know how to behave yourselves in the house of God which is the church of the living God. And one of the chief components of the conduct within the church is prayer. And so in chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, Paul says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. And this is in the context of the church. Sure, individually, privately, this is applicable to you and me in our prayer, but this is in the this is the conduct. This is how we behave ourselves in the church of God, which is or the house of God, which is the church of the living God. We are a house of prayer. Continuing in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says in verse 8, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And so if if Community Baptist Church is functioning as we ought to function under Christ, led by His Spirit, we will be a house of prayer. It will not be something that we simply talk about. When I said this morning that it's easier for me to preach about prayer than it is to pray, it's easier for all of us to talk about prayer than it is to pray, isn't it? But if we are a house of prayer, we are drawn to it, praying with one another regularly, not just saying we pray, but actually engaging in that. 
Prayer will be a default response to all of life together. As we live life together as a church, as brothers and sisters in Christ, in the context of Community Baptist Church, prayer will be a default response to all of life. And that's prayer together, not just prayer alone. Well, I'm saying these things, and really this message tonight is intended, is intended to be an encouragement and an exhortation to us because I sense that we need this. We need to be encouraged to pray together. I can't say for sure whether you pray privately. I think probably it's evident in lives in those who pray privately. It's probably evident in your conduct in the church, whether there's prayer privately, but I can't really judge that. But what I do know is that we need to be praying together. And there are examples in the New Testament that have been given to us, and I am sure that one of the reasons for these examples is an encouragement to us as a church in the 21st century to pray. And so let's look at some of these examples Going to the book of Acts, let's just read some of these examples together and be encouraged. This is an example that is established for us in the Word of God. In Acts chapter 1, the church in Jerusalem prayed together. In verse 12, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. What were they doing? I don't know that this is all that they were doing. I would assume they might have been talking about some things. They might have been batting some ideas around, some thoughts around. They were told they were supposed to be waiting for the Holy Spirit. Remember that? He said, wait. Jesus said, wait. Verse 14 says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They were together, and they were praying. As they waited, as they anticipated the promise that Jesus had given to them, they didn't just talk and discuss and have Bible studies and all the things that we like to do and that are good to do. We should do those things. But they were praying with one accord and supplication. When they needed to select an apostle to replace Judas, what were they doing? What did they do? Surely they talked about it. Some of the things that were said and um, are, I mean, just very, very minor expressions are given to their conversation. But notice verse 24, and they prayed, it says, And said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. They went together to the Lord in prayer. On the day of Pentecost, of course, they were in the room praying when all of this occurred, but I'm speaking after the message that Paul, that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost when there was a great conversion, 3,000 souls were saved. You remember the description that was given of what they were doing in verse 42, chapter 2, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Pra prayer Prayer was a primary part of what they were doing together. Praying. Turn to chapter 4. 
Again, the Jerusalem church here. There was, there were threats that were issued out to Peter and John because they were preaching in this name. They were causing a ruckus in the minds of the Jewish leaders, and so they were threatened, do not do that. And when they were let go, verse 23 says, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And what, what did they do? Did they begin to strategize a, re, a resistance to the persecution? Did they try to come up with a way in which to rebel against the proposed persecution? No. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and so forth. I'll not read all that's said there, but the point is simply this. They met together and they, they prayed. They went to the Lord, their God, their sovereign God, who was their father. And together they prayed. Do you notice it was with one accord that they did this? There was unity. This was an act of unity coming together and going before their common Lord God, who was our father, their father, praying with one accord, one mind to their father. In chapter 6, when the selection of deacons is, or what we propose, suppose to be the first deacons, though they weren't necessarily called that, and there was prayer associated with this. So it's one of the reasons why I call upon the church to at least spend a morning fasting and praying. And it wasn't necessarily that we came together, though there were a couple, but we at least were doing it maybe some have told me they were doing it in spirit. So in spirit, we were together with one accord doing that in a designated time, though not necessarily in the same place. They prayed. Acts 6 and verse 6 says, they prayed when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Chapter 12, when Peter was in prison, what was the recourse for the church? What did the church do? No question, there were a lot of things we could say, or a lot of things we could say about what might have been going through their minds. In fact, the, the account that's given to us reveals that they were a troubled group. Uh, very disturbed. In fact, we're not going to read it all, but you know, they, they didn't even really believe Peter was standing at the door when their prayer was answered. But what were they doing? They were... Praying, Peter, verse 5 says, was therefore kept in pr prison, but constant prayer, fervent, earnest, constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And they were gathered together, verse 12. So when he had considered this, he was released at this point. And when he came to his senses and realized what was going on, that God had actually released him from prison, he wasn't dreaming Verse 12, so when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Again, not open defiance against an oppressive government, but gathered prayer, seeking God together, our Father together. In chapter 13, the church again, we see praying here seems to point out the leaders within the church, though perhaps others were involved. Now, in the church, there was an Antioch that was at Antioch. There were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, and who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them, then having fasted and prayed." laid hands on them, and they sent them away. They prayed together. Paul and Silas, do you remember, were in prison. And we don't find Paul and Silas 
again, we don't know all that went on emotionally and even in their discussion, but what we know is what is given to us, what's recorded, and this is recorded for us to learn from and to pattern ourselves after. They weren't complaining. They weren't murmuring. They were in prison for the ministry that they were engaged in. But at midnight, Acts 16, verse 25, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. It, there's the idea they were doing this together. This wasn't an isolated thing just in their minds. They were actually engaged together. The prisoners were listening to them. That's interesting, isn't it? Listening to them pray and listening to them sing. Others were listening. As they together, they joined together in prayer. When Paul was, after he had met with the elders from Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, when he was departing to go back to Jerusalem, it says, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. There was a, a gathered prayer, a group prayer. And then again, just a few verses later into chapter 21, when Paul and his, this was, a, this was a few days later, maybe two or three weeks later, but Paul and his company prayed with disciples that had fellowshiped with them and they with them from, from Tyre. In chapter 21 and verse 5, when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. I'm showing you these examples to see that this is not an isolated thing. This, this characterized the New Testament church, the, it, the church in the New Testament. It characterized the life of God's people. They prayed together. And I'm not talking about just simply in a church service. I'm talking about in their lives together, they were engaged in prayer. Paul regularly called upon churches to support him in prayer. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11, you also helping together in prayer for us, help us in prayer. In Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16 and, or is it 1 Corinthians chapter 16? I think I have the wrong, 1 Corinthians 16, maybe it's not, maybe 15, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. When he said, you know, there, there's an effectual, pray for me, pray for me, there's an effectual door, remember that, uh, 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 that is opened up to me, where is that? Uh, in Romans Sixteen nine. That's not what I'm looking for. Okay, I'm confusing. I apologize. I I was not as careful as I should have been there. I wrote it. I wrote down for Romans sixteen and verse thirty, um, and I didn't double check it. Does anybody know? It's the, the verse where he actually calls upon them to join him, to labor in prayer together with him. Okay, anyway, it's there, but for some reason I'm not locating it. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 25. Brethren, pray for us. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1, the same thing. Brethren, pray for us. So you see the emphasis in the New Testament. Our Father, when we come together, we ought to come together as the people of God, as praying individuals desiring to pray with one another. What are the benefits of praying together? Can you think of benefits of praying together? Meditation? Edification? What is it? Peace? Peace? Yeah. The worship of God. Worship of God. To get an encouragement of one another in the worship of God. Thanksgiving. 
And isn't that an encouragement? We, we, we encourage one another in our mutual faith that when we come together and we're saying together, our Father, and when I'm joining in with my brothers and my sisters in prayer, our Father, our faith is encouraged. So sometimes, frankly, my faith is weak. Did, did y'all enter into that song that we just, that new song that says our faith is weak? Do you ever feel that way? You know, the exercise of faith is weak. It's there. And, and I have, at the end of a season of prayer, when we've come together, I have found my faith strengthened in praying together. When we join together before our Father, our, when we're thinking this way, our, it's not just I'm, I'm praying to my Father, it's I'm praying, I'm thinking our Father as we pray. Do, do, do you recognize, do you understand that it's difficult to remain at odds with your brother or your sister? Unity is encouraged when you're actually praying our Father as we enter together with one accord. So we're also, we're able to sympathize and empathize as, as our Hearts are exposed in prayer before our Father. Have we ever, have we ever prayed or have you ever been in a season of prayer? Whether it's in the gathered church or whether it's just with another brother or sister and you're hearing transparency. And, and, and I'm not saying that we should be totally transparent in the context of the gathered assembly. There's some things that are best reserved for, for the, the closet, <laughs> okay, <laughs> for the private time. But when someone is praying and they're just overwhelmed and they're overtaken, we were talking before we came in tonight, and I, and I said to the brothers, those that were out there, you know, it's very difficult for us to enter into the secret place in our minds praying in a public place but if we're all entering in together and we're someone is leading and they're addressing our father together and they just become overwhelmed in that moment first of all there would be nothing wrong with them just stopping have you ever been in a prayer session where somebody just couldn't couldn't express themselves any anymore and there was like 20 seconds 15 seconds that passed of just silence. Maybe you could even hear the person sobbing because they're just overwhelmed with what, of what they're seeing of our Father in that moment. But, but it makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? We don't like dead space. We don't like silence. We don't, we're uncomfortable if somebody is praying publicly and there's silence. We kind of feel like, you know, somebody said, you know, you feel like nudging them. Wake up. Well, you know, you wake them up. Or somebody else wants to start speaking because we can't have dead space, right? But, but if we're before our Father, is there anything wrong? And I'm not suggesting we try to do this. I'm just suggesting this could happen if we really are in the presence of our Father, there are times where we may be just overwhelmed with the flood of thought and that's going and the, the, the sole impact of being before Him, that there may be just some hesitation to say anything else. Is that okay? Is it okay that we all just hesitate together? Is it, is it okay that we all just sort of muse upon our Father and before Him together in the silence of the few moments that it may happen? And, and, and I'm suggesting that we may be a help to one another. Have we, have you ever been praying, been in the midst of a group prayer, and someone is clearly praying in a, in a, in a way that there's a, a sense that they are just before our Father, and you feel drawn in in a special way, and you're affected by that in the time of prayer. All of this is the benefit of praying together. 
as has been suggested. We, when we pray together, we share our common joys, our common griefs, our common trials, our common weaknesses, our common afflictions, our common strengths with our Father. And we enter, at least we should enter, the secret chamber of prayer together, not judging one another. And that can happen, can't it? When we're in a group session of prayer, where we're not really able to enter in, but we rather sit in judgment of one another's praying. That's not going together before our Father. I mean, if you can just imagine children maybe adult children or grown children sitting around and and speaking to their father together. And one of the children may say something that you might think, well, that's a bit strange what they just said. And you might give a sort of a twisted look or, you know, like, what? I don't, I don't get that, you know. Well, that can happen in our praying together, can't it? Someone says something and you think, what? I don't, I don't get that. But we're before our father, you see. And don't you think our Father knows? He sees. He, he's merciful, isn't He? He's long-suffering. And even if somebody is saying something out of line, He's saying it to our Father together. There have been times when I've been praying with someone, and even praying sometimes in the church setting here, where as someone is speaking to our Father, I am also speaking to our Father, and sometimes I'll have to say, Father, I don't quite understand what they're saying. I don't quite get it, but I, I trust you do, and I'm going to leave that with you. Do you ever do that? That's, that's, that's entering in together. Our Father. Not sitting in judgment of them, but actually extending some mercy and some patience and long suffering, giving people space to grow. There have been times where I am, I have probably expressed myself in ways in the years past that I wouldn't express myself now because I've grown and matured. We need to give one another that allowance, don't we? But we're doing this collectively as we go before our Father and then as we pray to our Father collectively, we're able to do as Paul indicated in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 when he called upon the church to pray. He said, you also helping together in prayer for us that the thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. This is sort of echoing what was said earlier. There is the giving of thanks when we when we express together our petitions before the Lord and then God answers those things, then we can collectively express thanks to God. And God is glorified when we give thanks together in response to answered prayer. So do we really need to gather together in prayer? Do we really need to prove the importance of praying together? Is that something that is necessary for us to be convinced of? It has enough been said tonight from scriptures to convince you that gathered prayer is something that God has purposed for us. I've been reading this book called A Praying Church by Dennis Gunderson. And uh, there's this, in chapter 5, he talks about the church praying together. He says, a biblical case for regular prayer meetings. And he has this paragraph. We're in crisis when we cannot even be enticed to pray with one another. The world is plunging rapidly into deeper wickedness around us. Sin and blatant animosity to the Christian faith advances rapidly in our own nation. Islam spreads and believers are being slaughtered at a rate not seen in centuries. And we really need someone to prove to us that the church should gather for prayer? That in itself is appalling. We must pray together. And that's only one aspect of, of the need to gather. I my own mind, I was thinking more about just our, our lives and the things that we go through as the people of God, supporting one another and encouraging one another in praying together. My question is this, is CBC a house of prayer? 
We know it should be. I don't know that anyone would object to that. It should be. Is it a house of prayer? Do you, Community Baptist Church, do you come together with a spirit of prayer? I was evaluating myself tonight as I was rolling that question over in my mind. Do I come with a spirit of prayer? I don't mean do I come anticipating that I'm going to pray publicly. I'm talking about a spirit of prayer so that I am I'm praying. Even if I'm not verbalizing prayer, I'm in the spirit of prayer and I'm calling upon the Lord with whatever is going on. I am, I'm in that spirit. And even when I'm engaged with a brother or a sister, anticipating that perhaps the answer that is needed as I engage with a brother and sister, maybe the answer is, let's pray together. Let's, let's pray together right now. Let's just, let's get off to the side. Let's, let's go up on the front chairs here in a room or let's just pray together. When's the last time you prayed with someone else? When's the last time you prayed with another person? I'm not talking about necessarily prayed in the church. I'm talking about just with another person, maybe, maybe your spouse. Is it uncomfortable to, is it uncomfortable to say to somebody, hey brother, hey sister, do, can we pray together? Is that uncomfortable for you? Does that make you squirm a little bit? I believe if, if that spirit was more a part of us individual members at Community Baptist Church, we might see some things occur that we have not seen. We may see some resolutions to things that we have not seen resolved. We might see some advancements that we would like to see but haven't seen. Maybe one of the reasons is we are not praying together. You have not because you ask not. Apply that on a personal level. And even in the area, we'll touch upon this when we go into the that portion of the Sermon on the Mount, but you know when Jesus says, talks about, he says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Connect that with what James says. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Seems like there's a relationship of prayer that's connected even with the relationship of asking forgiveness and resolving tensions that may exist between you and another brother or sister. And then there's the scheduled prayer gatherings within the church. Do you have a desire to be a part of those? I know everybody can't make it to every prayer gathering I am blessed and really have the privilege of participating in most of them because that's just, that's my life. I don't have a job outside. God has blessed me with the freedom to be able to join most of the prayer groups, uh, small or large, in the church. And I know everybody doesn't have that. So I'm not saying this to heap some sort of guilt upon anyone because you're missing a prayer gathering. But I'm just, I'm just saying to you, does that even register in your mind? Do you see the importance of it? And our scheduled prayer gatherings are Wednesday night and the first Saturday of, of every month. But there are other times, maybe impromptu calls for, for prayer. And by the way, that doesn't have to be just me. Anybody in here that feels a burden to pray for something, you can put out an email and say, hey, could anybody meet me here at the church? I, I just have a burden to pray together with somebody over something specific, perhaps. A house of prayer. I hope this exhortation tonight will be a source of encouragement toward us as a church in being more of a house of prayer.
Amen? That's a weak amen. <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, I'll take it that you, I hope that you see this. I hope that you see the significance of it. And I want us to be encouraged to be a house of prayer. Well, let's stand together and we'll close with prayer.